Hey nerds, I'm Chris, and I want to help you get beautiful recordings. Now, nobody likes recording with latency, so let's figure out why you're having latency, and then we can go over the different ways to fix it, depending on your preferred workflow. Because we're going to talk about several ways to fix latency, and they all have their own pros and cons. You see, a pro studio doesn't have latency problems, because there are solutions that work. If you watch this full video without skipping any sections, you'll be able to fix any latency problem with any recording setup. I'll go over what causes latency, how much latency is noticeable, how much is acceptable, and how much is preferred, how to reduce latency, and how to completely eliminate it with any recording setup. In order to fix any problem, you need to know what's causing the problem. When you record, the signal goes from the microphone, to the preamp, to the converters, to the DAW, back to the converters, then to your monitoring. I have another video explaining this entire recording chain in detail, but for this video, we're just going to talk about the parts of this chain that incur delays. So there's three separate areas that each cause a little bit of a delay. One is your DAW. The recording software will cause about 3 to 5 milliseconds of round trip latency in the audio signal. Two your interface drivers. This is the software that tells the computer how to communicate with the audio interface. And it can vary drastically, but will usually cause about one to five milliseconds of round trip latency. But sometimes it can even get as high as 10 or 20 milliseconds. And number three, your interface converters. This is fairly insignificant on its own. It's usually only about one millisecond. So how much latency can you have before it causes problems? We measure latency as a time value in milliseconds. Generally, about 10 milliseconds is the threshold for most people where it becomes noticeable. I'm going to demonstrate a few different values of latency with this click so that you can hear for yourself how long it is. For ideal recording, you want to have less than 5 milliseconds of latency. Between 5 to 10 milliseconds is still okay, but not ideal. Over 10 milliseconds of latency is generally not acceptable. It'll be uncomfortable for the artist, and it'll likely cause them to play off time. Instruments or sounds with a fast attack have a lower tolerance for latency. For instance, when strumming a guitar, latency will be less noticeable than when picking. And even when you're picking, latency will be less noticeable with finger picking and more noticeable when you're using a pick, because a pick has a faster attack. Instruments with a slow attack, such as a bowed instrument or a wind instrument, will have slightly higher tolerances for latency. For instance, a piano, which has a fairly fast attack, you wouldn't want to record it with 10 milliseconds or more of latency. But a flute, you could probably get away with it. Here's an example to help you put latency into perspective. Sound travels at a speed of about one foot per millisecond. So if you're talking to someone who's five feet away, you're hearing them with about five milliseconds of latency. If you're playing acoustic guitar and the instrument is sitting on your lap, roughly two feet away from your ears, then you're gonna be hearing it with about two milliseconds of latency. Electric guitar players often place their amp like 10 feet away. And in that case, they're getting like 10 milliseconds of latency. In your headphone mix as you record, because you can hear everything really clearly, your ears are going to be a little bit more sensitive to hearing that latency. When you're recording any instrument, as long as the latency is well below the noticeable threshold, the artist will be able to perform just fine. But the one exception where there's an advantage of having no latency at all, and I mean literally zero milliseconds, is when recording vocals. You see, with vocals, if there's even one or two milliseconds of latency, well, it's not noticed as a delay, but it does cause a change in their tone in which they hear themselves. This is because the vocalist hears themselves from two sources. They hear themselves from their own vocal cords acoustically through their head and into their ears, and then they also hear themselves through the headphones. Whenever two sources of the same sound are blended together, if one has a slight delay, it'll be out of phase, which results in comb filtering. I'm going to play a white noise here, and then I'll duplicate it and blend the duplicate with the original with a little bit of latency.
This type of phase misalignment is called comb filtering because the frequency response graph looks like a comb. Often in studios, vocalists will remove one side of their headphones and record like this so that they can hear themselves more naturally. In my studio, because I have absolute zero latency, vocalists never do this, and I mean never, it just doesn't happen, because the sound in their headphones is perfectly in phase and they can hear themselves very clearly and very naturally. This zero latency setup is something that can be incorporated into any recording setup easily with just a few pieces of gear, and I'll get to that shortly. The primary cause of latency for most people is from monitoring through the DAW. When you're monitoring through the DAW, the audio needs to pass through the interface converters, the drivers, as well as the DAW. And the combination of all of these will usually have a round trip latency of between 5 to 15 milliseconds. The easiest way to solve this is to just not monitor through the DAW. Most professional studios don't monitor through the DAW. The advantages of monitoring through the DAW is that you can hear yourself in real time through the plugins which you instantiate, and you can hear the actual sound being recorded. If the signal gets corrupted for any one of the millions of reasons that a signal can get corrupted, you're going to hear it right away. If you must monitor through the DAW, well, it's not possible to eliminate latency, but there are ways to reduce it. There's three sources of latency when you monitor through the DAW. First is the audio interface drivers, second is the software buffer, and third is the plugins. So the audio interface drivers. This is only really an issue with PCs, because Mac computers are standardized and they're highly efficient in how they handle audio. PC computers are not standardized, and some are more efficient than others. The consumer or the manufacturer can choose between numerous makes and models of individual components, such as the motherboard, the processor, the USB card, and all of the parts that make up the computer. There are also many different ways which manufacturers can program the built-in operating system, called the BIOS. With the wide variety of possible combinations, some computers are more efficient than others with how they handle audio, and certain computers will favor some drivers better than others based on how well that particular computer and its BIOS programming jive with the programming of the audio interface drivers. An audio interface that has low latency on one computer might have high latency on another. It's not the interface that causes the latency, it's the computer and how that computer handles the drivers for that interface. This is why it's so difficult to research which audio interfaces have lower latency, because there's a wide spectrum of different people getting different results. Two is the software buffer. All audio going in and out of the DAW must go through the buffer. This is an intentional delay that gives the DAW time to process the audio in the summing engine, as well as other processes that happen in the background. This is a setting that you can adjust, and you'll want it to be as low as possible. But how low you can go depends on the size of your project and how powerful your computer is. You can use a smaller buffer setting if you have a smaller project or a more powerful computer. And larger projects or slower computers will need a higher buffer setting. The buffer setting is measured in samples, so the actual amount of latency it causes is dependent on the sample rate. I'll talk more about that in a bit here. And then some plugins will cause latency in addition to the buffer setting. Plugins with a look-ahead feature are the worst for this, but many other plugins will also introduce latency. So it's good practice to have as few plugins in your project as possible. Having fewer plugins instantiated will reduce the computer's overall CPU load, which will not only enable you to select a lower buffer setting, but also reduce latency from the plugins themselves. Also, most DAWs have a feature where you can freeze tracks. This processes the track into an audio file with all its plugins and effects so that it doesn't have to process everything in real time. Freezing as many tracks as possible will also help reduce CPU load and reduce plug-in latency. So, how do we not monitor through the DAW? Well, the first and most simple solution is to use direct monitoring. This is a feature built into every audio interface available, where the interface routes the incoming audio signal directly to the headphone output. The monitored audio still passes through the ADDA conversion, so there will be about a millisecond of latency, but this is not noticeable. The vast majority of professional studios use direct monitoring. Now there are some drawbacks to direct monitoring, but they have solutions. First, you can't hear the authentic signal being recorded, and it could become corrupted. Now the workaround for this is extremely difficult, you're going to have to listen to the recording after you record it. Yeah, I know. But seriously, I've had people give me resistance on this because, I don't know, I guess they're just stuck in their ways monitoring through the DAW, and that's their main excuse. So yeah, it's good practice regardless of what type of monitoring you're doing, you should listen back to whatever you've recorded. Some people, mostly when recording vocals, like to hear themselves with a bit of reverb. 
Some audio interfaces have built-in DSP to add reverb or other effects to the monitored mix, but many interfaces don't. So, if your interface can't add reverb, then the easiest way to add the reverb to the monitor mix is to monitor through the DAW and instantiate a reverb plugin. It's a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy though, because monitoring through the DAW adds more latency and reverb helps to smooth it over and reduce the latency's impact. Reverb is also just a comfort thing. It doesn't actually help a vocalist sing better. Some vocalists say it does, but if you just don't give them any reverb, they'll perform just fine. I've done it many times. I'm actually of the opinion that vocalists tend to sing better without reverb because they can hear the precise nuances and imperfections in their voice a little bit better, which helps them to make more accurate micro-corrections. Anyways, not having reverb in your headphone mix is kind of a first world problem. We have bigger fish to chase. In my studio, I don't provide reverb to the vocalists unless they ask, and they have to be a little bit determined. I just say, yeah, it's no problem, but it's gonna take a few minutes for me to set that up. I mean, it's really not that hard for me, I just have to create an aux bus in my Metric Halo software, put the reverb on it, and they're good to go. That little bit of resistance is usually enough for the vocalist to just say, yeah, don't worry about it. Now the one thing that artists can't live without though is electric guitar players need to hear themselves through an amp. This can be a bit of a problem if you want to record DI. And so the easiest solution that a lot of people just fall back to is monitoring through the DAW, and they instantiate an amp emulation plugin, and then that's it. But then they're getting latency. So let's not do that. We don't want latency. There's better solutions for this. Now, just like Reverb, some audio interfaces will have built-in DSP that enables guitar amp simulations through direct monitoring, such as the UAD Apollo series. But these interfaces are also more expensive. If you don't have an interface with built-in DSP and you want zero latency monitoring as well as effects such as Reverb and Guitar Amp, the best solution is to implement an analog monitoring setup. This is what I have in my studio and it's easy to implement with any recording setup. Simply get a little mixer that has built-in effects such as the Behringer 1002 SFX. You'll also need to double the microphone signal. You can get an external preamp with two outputs like the Cranborn Audio Camden or even just use two microphones. If you use two microphones, plug the better quality one into the recording interface and that's the signal that gets recorded and the secondary microphone would get plugged into a channel in the mixer. Route your monitoring signal from the interface into a stereo channel of the mixer. Now, the artist has convenient and direct control of their own monitor mix, and they can use the mixer to dial in the reverb as desired. You can also use a microphone splitter to double the signal, something like the Radial Pro MS2. It can split the microphone signal into two or even three outputs, but I don't recommend using one of these because they will slightly reduce the sound quality. And we want our recordings to be as beautiful as possible, right? So let's not do anything that reduces sound quality, even if it's just a little bit. Now what I really like about this analog monitoring setup is that there's literally zero latency at all. Sound as an electrical signal flows through the wires at a speed of about 270 kilometers per millisecond. In miles per millisecond, for those of you that are in the United States, Liberia, and Myanmar, it's about 169 miles per millisecond. So from the time the sound enters the microphone until it gets to the headphones is pretty much instantaneous. Many audio interfaces advertise zero latency direct monitoring, but this is just a marketing tactic. There is in fact latency from the sound passing through the ADDA conversion. I've tested the round trip latency of direct monitoring in a few different interfaces. When recording at 44.1, the Neumann MT48 had one millisecond of latency. The SSL2 had 0.9 milliseconds, and the Behringer UMC 204 HD had 0 milliseconds of latency. What? That doesn't make sense. Actually, this had me a little bit confused as well. I had to double check my testing to make sure it's not a mistake. What I think it does is it just sends the signal to the headphone output in the analog domain before it goes to the ADDA conversion. So, with the exception of the Behringer, even the so-called zero latency direct monitoring still does have a little bit of latency. The only way to truly have zero latency is to have a pure analog signal path. So there's a few advantages to this. The main advantage is that the vocalist will hear themselves much clearer because there won't be any phase misalignment between the acoustic sound from their vocal cords that they hear in their head and the sound from their headphones. This really does provide a much more natural sound and it'll reduce the need to use reverb as a crutch to make it sound smoother. For recording electric guitar DI, there's a couple ways to do it using a reamp box. This converts a line level signal into a high impedance signal that mimics the output of a guitar, so you can use the signal from a line output or even the direct monitoring headphone output and send that signal into a guitar amp. 
For instance, the SSL2 has a rather typical layout for a two-channel interface. So with this interface, it doesn't matter which input you use, I'll just plug it into input 1 and use the direct monitoring headphone output to route just the guitar by setting the mix all the way to input. Now, the signal coming out the headphone output is only the guitar, and it's stereo unbalanced. So that won't work, I need to convert it to mono. There's many ways to do this, but the easiest way for me to demonstrate the concept of what needs to be done is to simply snip either of the signal wires. Not both, just one, and as long as it's not the ground, it'll work. So I'm going to open up this XLR cable, snip a wire, electrical tape it, and now we're good to go. Now I can plug a microphone into the mixer, set it in front of the guitar amp, and the artist can dial in their mix with the real sound from their amp. One of the themes that keeps coming up in this video is sample rate. Now explaining what sample rate is goes beyond the scope of this video, but I do have another video where I explain it, it's lesson 4, understanding digital audio. What's important for this video though is that latency from the DAW and latency from the converters are a set number of samples. You can reduce the time it takes for these samples to take place by increasing the sample rate. Traditionally, studios record at 44.1 kHz, but if you double this to 88.2, you'll cut the latency of your converters in half, and you'll also cut the latency from your DAW considerably. And you can go to as high of a sample rate as your interface allows, as long as your computer can handle the extra data. Now let's clear up some misconceptions about latency. First off, some people think Thunderbolt has lower latency than USB. The electrical signal travels the same speed through the cable, regardless of whether it's a Thunderbolt cable or USB. I know, everyone says Thunderbolt is faster than USB. But technically, it's not faster, it's the same speed, but it has more bandwidth. More bandwidth enables it to process transfers of large files much faster, which is why people say it is faster. But it's more like a five-lane highway compared to a two-lane highway. The cars drive the same speed, but the five-lane is able to get a lot more people to their destination. The higher bandwidth available with Thunderbolt or even USB 3 allows for more simultaneous inputs and outputs. USB 2.0 can handle dozens of inputs and outputs simultaneously, so for most home studios, there's no need for more than that. Thunderbolt can handle hundreds of channels simultaneously. If you're just recording one or two channels at a time, there will be no noticeable difference in the latency between USB and Thunderbolt. Now a small disclaimer here, Thunderbolt routes information directly to the memory a little bit more efficiently than USB, so it is in fact slightly faster, but it's so slight that it's not a worthwhile consideration. Anyways, if you're using direct monitoring or analog monitoring like you should be, then this doesn't matter anyways. Myth number two. Some interfaces have more or less latency than others. Now, I already talked about this. The only latency that the interface creates is from the ADDA conversion. And the difference between different interfaces is not remotely audible. If you're monitoring through the DAW, then yes, some interfaces will have more latency than others, but that's caused by the computer, not the interface. If you compare several interfaces and their latency when monitoring through the DAW, which one is the best will change depending on the computer, especially if it's a PC. Myth number three. Longer cables cause latency. Now, I already talked about this, but I'll expand a little bit. I crunched the math, and at 44.1 kilohertz, it would take a cable length of over three kilometers to cause one sample of latency. That's 0.02 or 1 50th of a millisecond. So as long as your cable length is less than three kilometers, there won't be any noticeable latency from the cable. So to summarize how to get lower latency, lower your buffer setting, Record at higher sample rates. Freeze tracks in your DAW. Use as few plugins as possible. Use direct monitoring instead of monitoring through the DAW. Or use analog monitoring. If you have any questions, feel free to join my Facebook group. It's called Get Beautiful Recordings, and I'm there to help you out. When I was first starting out, one of the biggest challenges that I had was I didn't have anybody reliable that I could ask questions to. So if you would like me to be that person for you, just join the group and I'll help you out as best as I can. I also post tips and tricks and little educational tidbits regularly. If you learned anything in this video, you might find my other videos interesting as well, so help me help you by subscribing to this channel and I'll see you in the next video.